What's up, taters? Hey, ladies and gentlemen, this is Tree from TreeOfLogic.com, and guess who I have with me again? Mr. Jared Taylor. He's back. I told you guys that I was going to have him back for a part two of our one-on-one discussion, and I'm so glad and thankful uh, to talk with him again. So, Mr. Jared Taylor, how are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. And I'm so pleased and honored to be invited back on your program. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. So much, oh my God, so much has happened since the last time we talked. But before we go into that, let me ask you, how are you doing? Are you having any tours coming up? Do you have any debates, any books that you're going to be writing, articles? Mm. You know, uh, fill us in on what's going on on your, on your side of the world. Well, we continue to put up a video uh, about once a week. I know that's a, a rather infrequent schedule by some people's standards, but that's about as what we can manage. We also do a podcast once a week. Uh, the webpage at amran.com uh, usually has some kind of uh, original content every day. But besides that, uh, we are involved in two rather grueling lawsuits, which uh, is something I really wish we didn't have to do. But these days, if you are a dissident, you have to get involved in the courts. But far more exciting and interesting, uh, in February, I'm uh, going on a bit of a lecture tour in Estonia and Lithuania and in Poland. And in oh. April, I'm going back to Europe and I'm going to be speaking in Helsinki, Finland, and also in Sweden, Stockholm. So I'm getting oh, around. Sweden, <laughs> really? Yes. Mm -hmm. Are you going to have security with you? Oh, no. Uh, I think, um, you know, bullets bounce off of me. <laughs> 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 no. Uh, actually, nobody's ever taken a poke at me, and uh, I'm hoping that will continue. And I'm not sure that Sweden would be any more dangerous than Virginia, which is where I ordinarily live. So, no, no, I, I, have, I, have, I have faith in the essential goodwill of my fellow man. As I say, there are people who will send death threats and who will get on the phone and promise to bash my head into a pulp against the nearest curbstone. But no one, no one has ever really tried a, a physical attack. And you can't entirely guard against that. You can take sensible precautions, yeah. but if you live your life locked up in a cage or walking around uh, in body armor, uh, you just can't live your life that way. I agree. I agree. I just, uh, when I heard the schedule, I was like, okay, cool. And then Sweden, I was like, whoa. I, I mean, I, I'm surprised they would let you there because they are, they're so progressive, or shall I say regressive. Mm. Yes. Um, that's why I was like, you're going to have security there? Because Stockholm's out of all places because um, it's very diverse there, as you know. Well, I've been in Stockholm before. I was at a speaking engagement there before, and they took uh, certain sensible precautions, and there were no problems at all, not, not even any demonstrators. And uh, I believe uh, there'll be the same kinds of precautions. I've, I've never really had a problem in any place in, in, uh, in Europe. The only time there were ever any real demonstrations was when I spoke to a group in Paris, and I wasn't the only speaker. There were a number of, uh, uh, oh, wicked people like myself, uh, some perhaps even more wicked. I don't know. But at least, uh, <laughs> wicked. <laughs> oh, you know, can't you see those horns going out of my head? If I stood up and turned around, you'd see my forked tail. Uh, but uh, uh, no, uh, on that occasion, they had they had a lot of uh, uh, police security, but they'd had some broken windows and things. I don't think it was all on account of me. Uh, I don't wish to flatter myself, but that's really the only time in Europe that uh, there's been any difficulty, and we managed to get in and out without any kind of trouble at all. It's, you know, the only time I've ever had a really serious disruption of a talk I was trying to give was in Halifax, Canada. And uh, a bunch Canada. of masked, masked yahoos. This must have been about 10 years ago. Oh, okay. They barged into this hotel ballroom that we'd rented. And uh, they uh, tore up all of our literature. And they surrounded me and forcibly pushed me out of the meeting hall and oh broke gosh. it up. Oh. Yeah. Th but that's, that's the only time I've ever suffered from that kind of actual physical manhandling. 
uh, it was all I could do to, to restrain myself from turning around and punching these swine. But, uh, you know, if there's ever any kind of fisticuffs, and uh, I'm, to begin with, assumed to be the bad guy. Yeah, so I'm absolutely. Not sure. It's going to be yeah. your fault, too. It's going to be my fault. But, no, it was, uh, it was a real case of assault. I, I pressed charges, but uh, the police were very lackadaisical about looking into this. They were clearly sympathetic with the people who were involved, mm -hmm. and uh, nothing ever came of it. It was really quite, uh, quite eye-opening in terms of what they care about. Of course, uh, right. if this had been uh, some kind of uh, immigrants' rights association or some kind of black power meeting and, and a, a bunch of people, I mean, we just don't do that kind of thing. But if uh, anybody had given them the same treatment, boy, oh, boy, they'd have hunted them down to the end of the earth. Yep, absolutely. But, but no, I, you know, I... Uh, as I say, I, I trust in the uh, the goodwill of my fellow man. Perhaps that's naive, but uh, I think that's better than always being suspicious. So. <clears throat> okay. I was watching a couple of your uh, uh, videos, um, I think about uh, several weeks ago. I came across the one, and I know you're familiar with this one, the one where you, I had no idea that you appeared in a documentary or, or some kind of show, uh, movie called Race War. And uh, mm -hmm. this was uh, the screening of the movie, and um, you were in a discussion with Kaba Kamine, and yes. um, <laughs> that entire uh, screening was was just to me laughable, and there were some cringy parts in there too. And I'm sitting there watching you peacefully talk, and you know you you really explain yourself well. You use facts. But I have to ask you about one thing you said, and I just uh -oh. couldn't help but laugh. And I and the people laughed also with what you did. You said, "Now this is not the, this is not a funny part. You, this is what yeah. you really meant." You said, "You want the best for black people, and I know you do. You do yes. want that, okay?" And mm -hmm. you said, "You want black people to be at their best. I do believe you want that." But then this <laughs> is the part I laughed. You said, "You want black people to build Wakanda." <laughs> and huh, I do and listen, I know you do believe that, right? But if you notice, I'm laughing. I laugh when you said it. So did the black people in the audience laughed when at you when you said it. What does that tell you? You know, it's uh, I think that laughter can be interpreted two different ways. One would be a kind of self-conscious, uncomfortable laughter that recognizes that it's just not very likely that black people are going to build a Wakanda. The other, the other is that they were laughing at me in surprise by hearing my expression of wanting blacks to be the best possible black people they can be. I think it can go both ways. Well, how do you interpret their laughter? I laughed at like, that's ridiculous, Wakanda, really? <laughs> and, and, and let me just, <laughs> let, let me explain my point of view. Yes. If I'm not mistaken, the two uh, the two countries in Africa that were not colonized by Europeans are Liberia and Ethiopia. Yes. Okay. Um, how close are they to being Wakanda? <laughs> not very close. That's right. Not so very close. I, I'm, uh, I'm saying I'm not delusional here to say that. Oh, if we never had any interference from white people, this is what Africa could be. There could be a Wakanda minus the uranium, the uranium or plutonium, whatever they're saying. I just looked at that and just like, I'm not, I'm not, as a black woman, I'm not delusional in knowing that that's just a pipe dream. But, but it was so nice to hear you say that because you really believe that just to show how well, sincere you are. If black people were capable of building Wakanda, I'd say God bless them. And, uh, you know, I really want all the people of the world to be the best uh, Asians, uh, the best Amerindians, the best uh, Southeast Asians or Tierra del Fuegians, the best people they can possibly be. I think we're all in it as human beings together, and there's no reason why we can't cooperate in letting every group flourish and blossom to the best possible extent. Now, I think there were people in that audience who did think that if black people were simply left alone and not colonized and persecuted by white people, they could build Wakanda. And I'll tell you why. I said something about how, uh, you know, I think that uh, white people are going to be better off and black people will live more 
authentic lives as black people if at least certain among, among us are allowed to separate and live and follow our own destiny as best we can and one of the black one of the black ladies said well you realize of course that if you go your own way you're not going to live uh, the kind of wealthy life that you are used to living with us uh, whom you are exploiting <laughs> in other words yes she said uh, she said that this wasn't the on the video face. it must have been no, a, that must no. have been doing a q and a part that 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 discussion lasted another 45 minutes at no least no way oh yes it did and i don't know why they've put up only that portion it just breaks um. off all of a sudden and some of the questions were really quite remarkable. She said, okay, you know, you think you're going to go your own way. Well, in effect, prepare for poverty when you don't have the extraordinary productivity of black people to leech off of. And I said, well, you know, the fact is uh, Sweden and Denmark uh, don't have many, a large black population. They're doing just fine. And so uh, I'm really not very worried uh, on that score. But, you know, there is there is a substantial number of black people who attribute the wealth of the United States to the extraordinary productivity of black people. And so I think she thinks, well, gosh, you black people all by white people all by yourself. Prepare for poverty without us to exploit. So, I mean, if we weren't there exploiting them, presumably they could build Wakanda. <laughs> it do take all sorts. <laughs> yeah, that, that's mm. that's that's when I realized that um, I I just saw I I guess people seeing you, my people, black people, see something totally different. I just saw the compassion, the sincerity in whites and the many whites, and I will say a lot of whites for other races that are not realistic but it's in your heart you really do believe and you really want this you want this more than we want this for ourselves yet still your pain is as a white supremacist and as a racist well you know later on later on in that conversation uh, i told them that i thought that louis farrakhan is a fraud yes he is and i'll, and I'll tell you why because in the final, in the, I think it's always on the last page of the final call, the newspaper of the Nation of Islam, there is this list of demands. Mm -hmm. And the list of demands is separate territory for black people, because as they say, it's unrealistic to think that the sons and daughters of the slave owners and the sons and daughters of the slaves can live peaceably in the same territory. Mm -hmm. Therefore, let my people go and give us a chance to be us. Well, when he was at that million man march, and uh, I don't think there were a million people on the on the mall, but there were an awful lot of people. And he had all the world's media uh, <clears throat> focused on him. I was thinking to myself, OK, Brother Louie, now is your chance to ask for separation. Not one word about nope. it. He never talks about that. And I think, I think, and I told that audience at that theater this, I think in his bones. Louis Farrakhan knows that if white people were to say, okay, here's, uh, I don't know, Texas and Oklahoma or Florida and Louisiana, or, you know, here's a place for you, that uh, black people, even under the leadership of Louis Farrakhan, oh, no, think, uh, it's a thought. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. I just, I just cringed it, when you said it, under the leadership of him. I was like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. It would not be paradise. It would not be heaven on earth. And he realizes that he's better off living among whites, keeping Whitey on the hop with his constant charges of racism and benefiting from the kind of technological and wealthy society that, that white people create. I think that is what, in his heart, he realizes because he's not at all a stupid guy. But he keeps this pretense up of black separation, which I think is really not realistic. And all of these black separatists, if you said, okay, you go your way and we'll go ours. I wonder just what they would think about that. And I think I, know, I have a very good idea what Louis Farrakhan would think about mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. exactly. But, you know, when, uh, when I said that to that audience, there was a kind of ripple of, yeah, he could be right about that. Uh, all, uh, on the whole, that audience was very hostile, and they just refused to take anything I said seriously at all. As that uh, a Camus, uh, a Cam, whatever Kaba, his name, Kaba, yes, Kaba, yes, yeah. Kaba, Kaba Kamenia, yeah. as he said, uh, uh, "This guy's dangerous. You can't believe a word he says." Well, well, how come? I'm, 
I'm speaking as honestly and frankly and as uh, uh, as uh, sincerely as I can, but uh, no, no, no. Uh, I guess everything that the white man and white men speak with forked tongue, you know, uh, so. They but anyway, said you uh, were dangerous because you uh, seemed reasonable. Mm, mm, that's right. I, I was dumbfounded like, He's dangerous because he seems reasonable. Why did you submit yourself to that? Well, you know, this is an embarrassing thing. <clears throat> when I was invited to the screening, I thought I was going to a different screening. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is my first public confession no on way. the battery. Yes, because about the same time that I had been filmed for this movie that turned out to have the name, well, I think it's called Race War. Yeah, it's called something. Race War. Race War. At the same time, I was filmed by a crew who was doing a documentary on Marcus Garvey. Really? And yes, uh, yes. And uh, I, I'm a big fan of Marcus Garvey. Yes, I know. I heard it. Yes, yes. And uh, so apparently, I other thought, blacks are not. They are not all about separatism. They don't want to practice what they preach. They're not. They didn't follow Marcus Garvey. But go on. No, you know, you no. are. And I was very amused how they just set that aside and yes. just poo pooed it. Like you're yes, white, you can't be a fan of Marcus Garvey. Exactly, exactly. Of course, I can be a fan of Marcus Garvey. But in any case, and this is so embarrassing. I am uh, often, well, I don't know, I'm, I just, pe people get confused and I sometimes get confused. And I thought that this was the premiere screening of the movie about Marcus Garvey. And that it was all going to be a festival of support and appreciation for Marcus Garvey. <laughs> So I didn't know until I was in New York City and I was in the, they, they sent a car to pick me up and uh, uh, I was talking to the lady who was driving the car and I said, well, wh what's the name they gave to this movie? And she says, uh, oh, I think it's called Race War. And I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> <laughs> this, this is a completely different movie. But, you know, I don't regret having been. It was it was a very interesting and sobering and in some respects saddening yeah. experience with with a group of black people who clearly are absolutely determined not to grant goodwill to any white person on any subject. I mean, of course, if I were a liberal and I were talking to them about how, no, we're going to lift you up and we're going to be so kind to you and we're going to make life wonderful for you folks, they would say, he's just a lying swine. But if I speak to them in a way that I think is entirely realistic, as someone who has thought a lot about, about race and about how people are happier, of what circumstances people are happier under, they won't believe me either. I, I really walked out of that room thinking these people are not going to believe a word any white person said. No. Why? Yeah. Then you was called the devil the whole entire time. Well, that's right. And uh, whereas, you know, in, in, in my experience, there is uh, a large number of black people who, once they really sit down and talk to me, and we can talk about race and IQ, or we can talk about what makes, uh, why, why separation is a healthy alternative. After a while, they say, yeah, yeah, I understand. I, I may not necessarily agree with all of your conclusions, but they, they accept that I am speaking to them because, and what I'm saying to them is what I truly believe. There, there's a good number of black people who are, first of all, they have a consciousness of race of their own for the most part. And then when they, re when they meet a white person who has a kind of equivalent consciousness of race, then this is something that they can relate to. I find often black people are easier to talk to about this than most whites. Whites have this completely, really? yes, white people have this cuckoo notion that if white people begin to think about their legitimate interests as a group, this is just unthinkable. The idea of white people saying, okay, we as white people have certain interests and we must defend them. This is just so preposterous in their minds. They associate it with trying to reinstitute slavery or recolonize Africa and Asia. Or just one crazy idiotic thing after another. But black people, because they realize, okay, we are a group. We have a certain feeling of uh, solidarity amongst our group. We have interests and we should legitimately defend them. When they meet a white person like me who discusses the same perspective from a white point of view, they uh, 
they understand. They understand in an, in, in an instinctive way that the vast majority of white people who have been brainwashed into thinking that white people have no legitimate group interests simply cannot grasp. But this 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 bunch, boy, uh, there was nothing I could say that would uh, get through this barrier of just impenetrable suspicion of white people. I, that's why I find it hard to believe that blacks are more receptive to this than whites, because every time I see you talk in front of a black audience, even on TV, you know, that's how I uh, uh, was able to hear you and actually what you were saying because you were so calm, you know, they were really coming after you. I think this uh, I think this was on a Montel Williams show. I can't remember, but it was so mm. long ago. Mm -hmm. And you were you were giving out statistics, you were giving out facts, and you were called all kinds of names by the audience. You were you know make fun of by the person opposing you on on the stage, and mm -hmm. and the thing about it is is that I I said to myself, well he he's not saying the n word. He's not you know saying we should lynch you up and have new mm -hmm. fruit on the trees. You didn't say any of right. that. You was talking very calmly as an and as a matter of factly. And which made me go and research what you were saying in, re in reference to race and IQ. And that's when I began to study up on it because of how you presented yourself. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. but you understand that this is one of many situations you have been in where you have been vilified. So that's the reason why I'm thinking, like, how well, can how can my people re be more receptive to this than than whites? I'll tell you, I'll tell you part of the problem. I think when uh, black people are in a group. They do oh. not want to be the first one to stand Good up and point. say, yeah, th this guy, this guy makes sense. And white people behave the same way. People are conformist. They don't want to stick out and be the one person to say something that they fear everybody else is going to jump on them for saying. But when they are one on one or actually, uh, I had this experience talking about race and IQ at universities back when I was not so wicked and loathsome that I never get invited to universities anymore. I would give a talk called Race and IQ, Latest Findings. And of course, this is a subject that uh, interests black people as much as it interests white people. Mm -hmm. And I would get these mixed audiences, maybe one third black, two thirds white. And I tell you, the first time when I was supposed to give a talk like that, I looked out over the audience, I'm being introduced, and I'm thinking, good grief, look at all these black people. I'm going to have to get up behind that podium and tell them, on average, you folks are not as smart as white people. And I thought, good, ah, oh, this is awful. I didn't, I wasn't sure my legs could carry me up the podium, <laughs> but really, I mean, it's not a, it's not a pleasant thing. But uh, I got up and I said, look, damn it, uh, this is true. I have all the facts. And I gave up. I got up and gave my talk. And first of all, you know, a couple of black people just got up and they were all ferocious and fierce. And you white supremacist, I can't believe that we had, had you on campus. They storm out of the room. Then the remaining blacks kept me on my feet for 45 minutes, maybe an hour, asking very pointed questions. Uh, the whites in the audience pretty much didn't ask any questions at all. And then later, a number of the blacks in the audience came up to me and in the most cordial way, they, they would shake my hand and say, Mr. Taylor, that was absolutely fascinating. So glad that you could be come, come to our campus and talk about that. And at first I was I was baffled, but that happened. That process repeated itself two or three times did because it? I had this. Yes, it did. And it dawned on me that I think, well, first of all, the whole race IQ question, it's interesting. And I know a lot about it and I can talk about it in a way that is factual and that makes the world make sense in a way that all of this sort of egalitarian fantasy doesn't make sense. And what I think is that the black people in the audience were very pleased and grateful that I did not talk down to them, that I spoke to them in a very truthful, honest way mm -hmm. about this still very touchy subject mm -hmm. of race, and they appreciated it. 
That was my interpretation of it. They felt they'd had an intimate and friendly and frank experience with a white man about this subject for perhaps the first time in their lives. And they felt a kind of closeness to me on account of that. That's my interpretation because they were so cordial, so friendly. I, I really wish now that I'd stayed in touch with some of those people. And that, that was part of it. And then later on, as I began to realize that there are, there is this, I think, substantial number of blacks that is perfectly willing to talk about race and IQ, separation, all of these things, but they are never, ever heard from. Then in individual conversations, I've found that Black people are receptive to the idea of white racial consciousness when it is presented in a mutually respectful way. But not that group in that theater. <laughs> no, no ma'am. Ah. They anything, weren't having it. <laughs> anything out of my mouth was a lie and an insult and a uh, speech of the devil. Oh, it was... Uh, no, they're, they're a pretty tough bunch. But I do wish that they'd had, that they had, now I assume that they recorded the entire Q&A session. They don't show it on YouTube, though. No. That's the thing. They only, show, they only show you presenting your your case with studies and statistics and com actually, like I say, with compassion and mm -hmm. sympathy. And then yeah. they show, okay, the host was even biased against you. Yeah. Oh gosh, he was insulting, really. Yeah, he was insulting. Uh, he was insulting. Uh, he he was shouldn't very have behaved insulting, that way. Yeah. yeah. And and then then he went over to Kaba, who was like just brushed you all over, didn't address mm. any of your arguments, and no. then like you see how you people laugh, you're laughing, and, and it goes on and on on the, in the emotional rhetoric, and then calling you white devil for several times, mm. and I'm saying. When are we going to get some facts out of you guys? Nothing. Nothing was nothing but pure opinion, opinion, yeah. opinion, opinion. And right. hey, Jared Taylor is a devil. You know, I think that uh, that whole panel discussion Q&A went on for, oh, maybe an hour, 20 minutes, an hour and 30 minutes. It went on quite a long time, but for some reason they chopped it up and all we get is maybe the first 20, 25 minutes. Yes. It's a real pity because uh, I think the exchanges that I had were, were really quite eye-opening. I wish I'd recorded it myself. I realized well, that they were... That's just how deceptive they are, though, doesn't it? I don't know. In my uh, opinion, in my opinion, it shows deception because like, why not show the whole thing? I would have loved to see that conversation between the you and the black lady who said, well, you know, if we don't have any black folks, you white folks are going to get poor. I would have loved right. to hear that. Uh, she said it. And uh, no, I, I should probably have recorded it myself, but they had, they had all the all the good sound equipment and the video right. equipment and all. I just didn't think to, uh, to record it. But, better, but, yeah. yeah, but and probably the whole thing exists somewhere. It's just that uh, for, for reasons utterly unbeknownst to me, they decided to cut it off. I don't think that I said anything at the end or there were any questions to the audience that were particularly I don't know that, that there was no particular reason to cut it off there. I, I just don't know why. That's what I'm but saying. Anyway. I find it suspect because possibly that would go against their narrative. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't like to attribute nefarious motives to people uh, for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mean, going to go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, I think, I think Napoleon once said uh, uh, something like, never attribute to maliciousness what can be explained by incompetence. Mm. And uh, I, I think that's generally pretty good advice. Uh, so I, I don't know why they had only that portion of it. I wish they had had the whole thing. But, you know, it was their show and uh, they paid my airfare up and no, my train fare up and back. And uh, so it's, it's up to them. Uh, I can't insist that they broadcast the whole thing, but I certainly wish that they had. I am. Um very excited to have a particular conversation with you in reference to race and IQ. And I think you're the only one uh, at the moment uh, that can basically give me some insight to it. Um, as we know, on average, um, based upon uh, research and study, that the average IQ of blacks is 85, whites is 100. And then when you go on and on and on. But I only want to talk about blacks and whites, right? Okay. All right. I have been... A lot has happened. Oh, my God. A lot has happened, Mr. Taylor, since our last discussion. And I, I have experienced some ignorance from whites that made me question 
the average IQ level of them. <laughs> of light. Yeah. And, and let me yes. explain. And let me explain the list. And I, I'm going to, of course, I never, you know, disrespect you and, and interrupt you when you are explaining something to me. But I cannot wait. I'm salivating to your answer to this. So when I started to notice, you know, a lot of whites on the right embrace identity politics. This infuriated me. This really felt like a betrayal. And I felt deeply saddened and angry because I left. I was born uh, to two parents. They divorced when I was five. And I grew up in poverty under a very abusive mother in the ghetto until I ran away and mm -hmm. as, at the age of 11. Okay. With the help of white people, and I, I went to go live with my, my dad, and I got out of, I went from the ghetto to, to the black suburbs, okay? And I got out of that situation and went to college, and I made a success out of myself to where I have escaped out of the black community because of the violence, because of the, the, the way, the music, the, the culture, puts down black women where it, 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 I can go on and on. The single mothers, mm -hmm. all of this stuff. I can go on and on, okay? I left out of that community to go into a place where I am respected, which I thought the Republican Party, which I thought the conservative party was about, where I have taken advantage of the American dream and made it my own. And I was judged by my character. I was judged by my accomplishments. But the most important thing with coming to the right it was I was judged by my principles. Okay. And all, and, and the things I wanted to do was just be surrounded by those who had that like mind, but that all went to hell because now we're embracing identity politics where the same thing I escaped from white people want to bring it back. They want to bring it not back, excuse me, bring it to the side where I am on. And I felt betrayed with the level of them white people catering to identity politics, which was something that white liberals were doing, we were doing. And then when I started looking at the whole entire case where they were saying, I have to embrace other blacks who think the way they want them to think, that in itself is racism. You're saying, because I'm black, I can't think on my own. And then... Then on top of that, so this is what I'm dealing with the right. So then when I look at the left, left, white people are saying the following. Now listen to this. There are 76 mm -hmm. genders. Race is a social construct. Men can have periods. Uh, and then they have these white women who have these little boys that are turning into trans or drag trans kids where we have Desmond D. Amazing. Uh, and who has stri who uh, who did a semi strip in, in a gay bar in, in an adult gay club, and he's only eleven years old. Lactasia is the white work one. They both are white, but this one is from America. Lactasia is from America, where they're saying that they're it's almost like they're one step from pedophilia. Then we got the whole. White people are so triggered, they need coloring books. They need to wear safety pins. They need the safe space. Then we have white women who are accusing white men of toxic masculinity. <laughs> then we have, yeah. of course, which is, which is one of the things of having low IQ, if you can't express yourself verbally, you result to violence. Well, hello, Antifa. Okay. Hello, redhead uh, feminist who wants to punch people because you're upset that they said something that you consider racist. Then we got going to, oh, here's my favorite. Then we have, you have the white nationalists talking about some, the Jews are the reason why they're not having any kids. And so now there's no accountability for you as white people, just like black people. Black people want to blame white people. And it's like white people are now taking on the victim mentality that I am very familiar with when it comes to white folks. And then, uh, and then, okay, I can go on and on, but I'm going to stop right here. I'm going to say this because I got a whole long list. But last but not least, okay, Macron mm -hmm. said, Macron, Emmanuel Macron out of France said this. And this is when I just had to just go and scream. 
Patriotism is the exact opposite of nationalism. Nationalism is a betrayal of patriotism. This doesn't sound like intelligence to me. This sounds like pure ignorance. And now I'm saying to myself, "Uh uh-uh, they can't have no average IQ of 100 because I I can't tell the difference between them and my own people. Okay, I'm done. Well, uh, Well, no, that was a worthy and justified rant. And it does make you wonder whether or not white people are taking stupid pills. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, I uh, this is only half a joke, but I say, for example, you know, this this theory that race is some kind of uh, sociological optical illusion that, you know, we look, we look at an Eskimo and we look at a Congo pygmy and any differences that we see are something that we have been taught to see. It's they are socialized or they are racialized into looking different yes. and that they are, you know, they're absolutely the same, really. I mean, that idea is so obviously wrong and so stupid that only very intelligent people could persuade themselves that it's true. Really? Uh, well, yes, because look, look, uh, how many just sort of ordinary, well, how many, how many black people, for example, do you know who think that race is some sort of optical illusion? None. Nobody. None. 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 They, I know, don't know they know better than that. They know better than that. It's only these high IQ, overeducated, uh, super self-conscious white people who even pretend to believe this baloney. And the idea somehow that men and women are fundamentally the same. And that it's only because we've been socialized in some particular way that men and women behave in a different way. And then once you find that men are behaving differently from women, that's toxic. I mean, this too, any person with the IQ of a fried egg understands that that's just just complete nonsense. You have to have a really weird, twisted sort of high IQ imagination to come up with stuff that is so obviously wrong. So... It is true that all of these things, and like, like Macron saying that nationalism is the opposite of patriotism, I, I, again, I think sort of an ordinary person who sort of clumps through life without uh, cudgeling his brains too much with all of this twisted uh, exotic logic would never come up with something like that. It takes a certain intelligence com- combined with uh, a kind of self-loathing to come up with these weird formulations that are so obviously wrong. But uh, I, I don't know, I just can't, I just can't explain it. White, white people, this idea that the sexes are equivalent, that all the religions are equivalent, that every culture is somehow equally beautiful and true, all of these things that are so obviously wrong and which everyone knows is wrong, how we come up with this kind of futile egalitarianism, it, it's really a mystery to me. And in, you know, 500 years from now, if, you know, white people really do just go down the drain and we just say bye-bye and give up without a whimper, the great Chinese uh, encyclopedia of the world is going to have a little entry on white people. And it's going to say, yeah, yeah, for a while, while these those white folks are doing pretty well. You know, they invented all this stuff and they conquered the world. And, and then they just sort of disappeared. And uh, we don't know why. That's so uh, sad. It, it Well, yeah, it's sad. It is very sad. But unless white people wake up, that's that's what we face. And it is it is all tangled up with these somehow these utterly self abnegating fantasies about equality and pathological altruism that white people have got themselves all balled up with. And uh, I, I've been trying to figure this out for the last 40 years, what it is about white people that has turned them into lemmings on their way off the cliff. And I don't have a good answer for why we're doing it. Then is it really, then is intelligence, uh, okay, let me just say this. I still do believe like Asians have demonstrated perfectly because they don't do this. No. Okay, so, cause, so therefore, because they are more intelligent than whites. So then, based on average, we got to keep saying it on yes. average because everybody always likes to put the hashtag. They're so sensitive. Nah, right, uh, right. nah, uh, nah, uh. 
average. Okay, we're talking about an yeah. average on the bell. Curve. Right. You know, as, as if anybody thought that anybody was ever saying every white person is smarter than exactly. every black person. Come <laughs> on. But, yes, but we have to add that little caveat. No, yeah, we're talking only we about average. We always have yes. to. We'll always That's have right. to. In the comment section, they'll sit up here and say, now, I know my aunt is. We'll go into all the, the alum, right. you know, the, the outliers. But anyway, but I see that, I see Asians, okay, and they do behave in a way that's that's of higher intellectual, you know, basically high intellect, excuse me. But then when, that's what I said what made me question whites was because it's like, well, what's the, the, this, is this really something of higher intelligence? Because now whenever I can't tell the difference between arguing with the average black person versus arguing with the average white person, then where does intelligence lie? <laughs> you know, intelligence is not the same thing as having healthy instincts. And in the case of uh, Asians, it's not just the North Asians who are on average smarter than white people. It's also, you know, the, the Southeast Asians who on average are not as smart. They still have, and, and you, can, you can go all the way down the line, intelligence does not seem to have any correlation at all with a healthy sense of self and peoplehood. You can talk, oh, uh, you can talk okay. about uh, the African Aborigines. You can talk about uh, the people on New Guinea. Uh, those groups have certainly not made great contributions to world culture and their average IQs are not very high, but they still have a sense of real solidarity. They want their people and their traditions to flourish and to survive. Okay. Every group does. Every group does. It's almost instinctive. It's it's like, uh, you know, I, I don't wish to draw uh, uncappy parallels, but it's like a, a group of any mammals. They want their band to continue. It's instinctive. And white people used to have that instinct up until maybe 50, 60, 70 years ago. White people had the sense that, yes, we have a destiny as a people. And uh, when that destiny really got overwrought, they had this idea that they were going to bring Western civilization to the entire world. The French had this idea of mission civilisatrice, uh, in other words, the civilizing mission of France to go into West Africa and uh, teach those teach those darkies French and teach them history and bring them up to the white level. White people had this kind of messianic view. Now, not only have they lost that messianic view, it's been completely inverted. And I think we really are the only group that is actively building up a funeral pyre for our own destruction as a people, as with territories where we can be ourselves. Just, just the other day, I was being interviewed by some British guy. And uh, I was, he was sort of poo-pooing the idea that white people were, had done anything remarkable. And I was telling him, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, uh, the, the Industrial Revolution, all these scientific inventions, we, we built the modern world. Come on, you have to admit that. He says, oh, but don't forget, Arabic numerals. White people didn't come up with that. I, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, here is a guy who is so reluctant to think well of his own group, that he's clutching at straws to try to think, try to downgrade and denigrate the achievements of his own people. Can you imagine anyone of any race taking that view? No. Of, of, <laughs> yes, it's impossible. <laughs> Only white people are sort of searching desperately for some example to prove that well, we're really not so great after all. Cool. I mean, that's just sick. I mean, uh, ordinarily, people are clutching at straws to come up with any justification to think that they're great. But white people are clutching at straws for any excuse to justify thinking that, oh, we're miserable exploiters with the cancer of history. It's, it's, it's a, it is a sickness. It's a sickness that is exclusive to my people. And frankly, I do not know where it comes from. I mean, there are various theories about, uh, uh, you know, the, the, first, the First and Second World Wars were these devastating things that uh, made white people wonder what they were up to. And uh, some people think Christianity with its sort of universal this, that, and the other is a problem. And some people say, you know, the Jews have this constant message delegitimizing any kind of white racial consciousness. Other people have one idea. That, I don't know. I don't think any of these explanations really gets to the heart of what is a kind of suicidal impulse that's without precedent in the history of the world. I agree. I agree. Wow, you're giving me so much to think about. I'm just, I'm had to just rewatch this because, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, 
thank you. That that kind of like soothes my anger a little bit with because I was very angry with with many whites with what they were doing. Uh, that was not only self destructive to themselves, but it also was self it was destructive to me. You know. Well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you something interesting. Uh, you would probably be surprised how many messages that we get at American Renaissance from people all around the world, from Africa from the Indian subcontinent, from Asia, from people who say, look, white folks, don't commit suicide. Mm. You have done great things for the world. The world needs white people to be white people. It's really, it's very touching that they react in that way. They see what we're doing to ourselves. And uh, I remember a conversation I had with a fellow named uh, John Brock. Uh, he was, oh, decades ago, he was a, a black separatist, and uh, he really thought uh, white people were were the devil. But we we got we got friendly, and uh, we would have these telephone conversations. And uh, one absolutely stuck in my mind. He says, uh, he says, you know, Jared, of course I'm all in favor of it, but why are white people committing suicide? He could see it, I can see it, you can see it, and all of these people all around the world see it. But why are white people committing suicide? And they don't even know they're doing it. They think they are virtuous. They think it's a wonderful yes. thing. They think they're so fine and so good <laughs> by turning their own countries into these sort of polyglot mishmashes of people unlike themselves, many of whom actually hate white people. They think they're just so wonderful on the side of the angels. They're building this new world where white people might very well disappear, but that, that'll just be a great thing. Where does this come from? I wish I had the answer. I always think that if I had some answers to where it came from, I'd be better at trying to sort of re reverse engineer the process and help people wake up to the fact that, no, no, you, you do have a right to be white and you do have a right to think it's okay to be white. Uh, but no, I, I just don't have a good answer to that question. Yeah. Do you think there ever will be an answer to that question? Maybe. Maybe it'll take a smarter guy than I am to get to the bottom of it. But the thing is, it is so against all of the instincts that ordinary people have. As I say, most people want to think well of themselves. They want to think well of their group. And they want their group to be healthy and thrive. I mean, people establish very strong affiliations for what are sometimes really rather abstract and not necessarily really blood and guts reasons. For example, uh, you know, people go to a university and they get all wound up in that university and there's a football rivalry and oh boy, it's like going to war. They really want yay team. Or people will work for a particular company and they get very interested in uh, sort of besting the competition. They devote themselves to the success of that group or for their bowling league or for whatever it is. We are a species that really invests itself in groups and we are loyal to groups. And every other race, every other nation is naturally and healthily devoted to and invested in that group and race. It's only white people who aren't, and it's only white people in the last 50, 60, 70 years who've become that way. So what has caused that is, as I say, a great mystery, and I wish I did have the answer to that question, but I don't. And maybe somebody will, but as I say, it's going to have to be somebody that is more better informed, uh, more insightful. Uh, as I say, there are many theories about this, and I've read many theories about this, but none of them really convince me. You know what's so surprising? I was just sitting here listening to you and it just occurred to me that the compassion you have for blacks and how you want them to be at their best, I, I, I am the same way with whites where mm. I am not seeing them at their best no. and I have the compassion to want them to be at their best, you know, for them. And I just see we just had the same, we, we're, we're both, have the same goals for the opposite race, you know, because I, and I guess that comes with, you know, caring, you know, we do care about that. And, and I think the reason, not no thing, the reason why I am so angry is because I am frustrated. You, you probably already went through this phase where 
I'm already frustrated. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to just slap white people in the face and say, wake up, stop it. I don't know yeah. what. And so therefore, and then I, uh, and uh, I left, uh, and we're going to talk about Trump in a minute. <laughs> I left the Republican party and went independent because I was just so mm-hmm. pissed off about, you know, how our side was playing identity politics and just catering to, you know, the communities that they don't really care for. And I, I was telling Republicans and I was telling cons- white conservatives, look, the Democrats do a lot, regardless of how much you keep talking about telling blacks to get off the Democratic plantation. That's basically belittling to them. They don't you need to come with more. What are you going to give them for the vote? You and, mm-hmm. and you know you have to regardless of what you feel about the Democrats, they are giving black people an incentive to be on their side. What are right. you? If we're supposed to be all about the American vision, the American dream, and you want to cater to now identity politics, that means you're going to have to give one group something more than the other. When did we start doing that? I, and not until not until 2016. Yeah, it um, well. <laughs> I think that you could argue that white people and Republicans are, to the extent that anybody in the United States is thinking in terms of a uh, Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we had a technical difficulty that occurred, so we're going to pick up where we left off. Mr. Taylor, what, what you were you were responding to me stating that I was frustrated with the way that uh, whites were going and that your your compassion and your the way you want blacks to be at their best is how I want whites to be at their best. It seems like we both have the similarities there where we want the, uh, uh, the opposite race to be at their best, but apparently it's not working. And you was responding to my, my statement about that. Yes. Uh, and the fact is I want all nations to be at their best. Uh, for example, I've spent a lot of time in Japan and I know the Japanese very well. They are now talking about uh, establishing two new visa categories for unskilled labor and uh, skilled labor that could bring more and more non-Japanese into Japan. Okay. They are not They are not having enough children to replace their population. Their population is shrinking. And rather than try to raise n- natality rates, they're going to import workers. Now, I think this is a tragic thing. Yeah. Japan is a wonderful and beautiful country. It has a really exquisite and delicate culture of its own and they simply cannot expect Iraqis and Pakistanis and Filipinos to carry their culture forward in a meaningful way. It would be terrible if Japan became minority Japanese. Now I feel the same way about every single culture in the world. If you go to uh, if you go to African countries, you see you see Africans walking around wearing T-shirts with uh, Madonna on them and listening to listening to degenerate Western music and their authentic way of life is crumbling and disappearing. I, I want I want black people, Japanese people, Africans, Asians. So the subcontinent of India, for example, they too have a, have a long and ancient culture that is being eroded through contacts with some of the worst aspects of uh, of so-called Western civilization of of Hollywood. Uh, I remember a just a heartrending story about when television came to Mongolia. Well, here are these Mongolians living in their yurts, their tents made of felt. Uh-huh. And and guess what? Guess what? One of the most popular broadcasts on Mongolian television was. What? You'll never guess. Baywatch. No. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yes. Here you, here you have these <laughs> Mongolians <laughs> goggling at the screen where you've got these uh, pneumatic blondes bouncing around in their bathing suits, 
Good grief. Is, is that is that really what Mongolia is supposed to be doing? It, it's just it's just poison, absolute poison. Now, who am I to say, OK, Mongolia must remain in a, the pre-television era. Mongolia must not have electricity. I mean, I don't have the right to say that. But it is grievous to me that Mongolians should be sitting in their tents with their herds of yaks outside watching Baywatch. <laughs> What, what do you do about this? I, I, I want Mongolians to be Mongolians, mm -hmm. not not some kind of, uh, I don't know, ersatz um, Hollywood accretions. It, it, I, I don't know what, what can be done about this. But in order for real authenticity to survive, there has to be a certain amount of separation and pride in one's own and not be seduced by these superficially appealing the superficially appealing rubbish that comes from someplace else. How, how uh, you have to have a self-conscious people that is proud of its own culture. And the Chinese are, are that way to some degree. I mean, we can yell all we like about how, you know, they, they don't let the internet into their country. itself by governing the news. But at the same time, they are maintaining a certain Chineseness about mm -hmm. their country. And I think that's admirable, just the way the Eastern European countries are saying, look, uh, we are European, we are Christian, and no, we're not going to accept these Muslim, these Muslim backpackers that Angela Merkel wants to shove into our countries. Mm -hmm. That is what is required for real cultural authenticity and, furthermore, for real diversity. This diversity the left is always yelling about and thinking it's such a wonderful thing. No, diversity taken to its extreme turns every country into the same... Uh, the same utterly authentic uh, commercialized mush that uh, is is that destroys all of the distinctly beautiful and unique things that uh, the human population has produced all around the world in a kind of isolation without which those beautiful and unique things would never have appeared. Now I'm going to uh, give you a response from most white people. And I want you to, I already know the answer to this, and I've told them this answer, but I want to hear yours first. Now, when they hear this, they're going to say, we as white people, this is because I hear this all the day, all the time. We as white people can't be proud of our race because that's going to be considered racist and we're going to be called racist. Well, if white people shrivel up and blow away simply because they're afraid of being called racist, then there's just no hope. Uh, as I often say, uh, if you call somebody a racist, uh, that's just name calling. And name calling is the worst way of conceding that you've lost the argument. Say, if I make some kind of argument about uh, racial differences in IQ and somebody says, oh, that's racist. They've basically lost the argument. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's, a, that's a really yeah. graceless way of admitting I don't have any facts. I can't refute you. I'm just going to call you names. Yes. But... White people have become so sensitive to this kind of name calling. It, uh, I mean, it seems that white people would rather disappear and go extinct rather than be accused of racism. The most elementary measures to preserve our peoplehood and our culture are called racist, white supremacist, Nazi, whatever it is. And if we are going to be daunted by that kind of name calling, there really is no hope for us and we don't deserve to survive. Mm, good point. All right. So let's go on. Uh, I want to spend the next, uh, uh, let me see, 15 minutes uh, on, uh, on our, our favorite topic here, uh, President Trump. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Oh, I right. I, listen, listen, listen. The mm. last time we talked, yeah, mm. the last time we talked, I was like, I had the rose colored glasses on, right? I was like, oh, Mr. Taylor, you gave, you was talking with CNN and you gave Trump a B minus. And, and now <laughs> what do you do? And you're like, well, I give him a B plus because he's not Hillary Clinton, right? Well, <laughs> I, give him a, I give him an A plus for that. <laughs> A plus plus plus. That's what you did. You did say A plus 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 plus. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you was like, but overall, you's like is a, a B. What do you give him now? 
Mm. Well, the fact that he's actually dug in his heels and shut down the government in the name of the wall, he's showing some backbone. Okay. And he, he is finally doing something that uh, was part of his main campaign promise. That was his signature issue. Now, it seems to me, now I don't know what goes on behind the scenes, but it seems to me a sign of gross incompetence that he didn't really dig in his wall on the subject of the, uh, dig in his heels on the subject of the wall until he lost the Republican majority in the House. Yeah. Good grief. Yep. Good grief. Come on. Yep. He's, he's doing tax reform and he's trying to take with Obamacare. Prison reform. Don't that. Prison yes, reform. Pres and then yeah. the, the bump stock ban. I'm really angry right, about right. that one. Why? Why didn't he concentrate on the central issue, his number one promise, while he stayed a majority in both houses? Mm. I mean, I'm I'm no expert on how the government works, but it seems to me that if you've got something important you want to push through Congress, you do it while you've got the majority. <laughs> but uh, no, he seems to just bounce erratically from one idea to another. The other thing that I really fault him for is not having gone uh, – even just, he, he could have, I think, while he still had a congressional majority, he might have been able Congress to pass something on birthright citizenship. Or, lacking that, just by executive order, he could say something like, okay, just because you're born in the United States, if you parents are foreigners, you're not American. Mm -hmm. He could issue an executive order. Now, that would be challenged and taken to the Supreme Court. But at least he would be doing something that could be very, very useful. That was another one of his campaign promises. He's going to go just open up uh, with all guns blazing against birthright citizenship, with this utterly, utterly crazy system whereby, you know, fr frankly, I think the way it works, if you're flying over the United States and you give birth in an airplane, your child is a U.S. citizen. I, I, you? No, that's so, that, that sounds crazy, but I think that's true. <laughs> I think it is true. You're within the territory of the United States. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, these, these, uh, these uh, pregnant Central Americans who sneak across the border and then go to some charity hospital and have a child, and lo and behold, now we have a new U.S. citizen and a new mother of a U.S. citizen yeah, entitled to yeah. all the oh. rights. This is insane. And I think there is a large number of Democrats who recognize that this is insane. At this point, of course, if Donald Trump proposes anything, if Donald Trump were to propose, uh, I don't know, free beef steaks for all poor people every Friday, they'd be opposed to that. They'd be opposed to everything that Donald Trump ever proposed. But there are many, many Democrats who think this idea of just anybody who manages to wander into the country and has a child, that's going to be a U.S. citizen. It just doesn't make sense. They immediately, many of them are, are poor. They don't have much education. The child gets all these welfare benefits. That's just not right. And most Americans, no matter what their political affiliation, don't like that. Mm -hmm. I think he could have gone far. Of course, the New York Times, the Wall Street, and uh, even while well, the Wall Street Journal, which is uh, this open borders cabal, all of the media would have said, oh, this is horrible. This is, goes against, uh, what is it, uh, the 14th Amendment. Uh, yeah. No. No, most Americans think this is nuts. And he could have done something. He didn't do anything. And of course, about DACA, too. The first day in office, he was going to, with a stroke of the pen, he was going to issue a presidential order that undid a presidential order, which I think was uh, essentially unconstitutional, what uh, this executive amnesty for all these uh, illegals who were brought over as children. So uh, he's just not consistent. And uh, some people will complain that once in office, he's governed more or less as a conventional Republican in terms of taxes and uh, uh, in terms of trying to go after Obamacare. Uh, but so he has these occasional bursts, these paroxysms of good sense, but then he just gets lost on these tangents. I do, you know, many people who have worked with him do seem to think that he is erratic. He agrees with the last person he's talk, he's spoken with. He's concerned about the last uh, the last particular big issue that uh, CNN or Fox uh, Fox News says is important. So in that respect, I'm disappointed with him. But again, uh, I cannot imagine a Democrat running in 2020 for whom I would vote, and I cannot Same imagine. Here. Yep. <laughs> I cannot imagine a Republican challenger in the primary for whom I will vote. And so I will certainly vote for Donald Trump if he runs again. Yeah, I will, too. Um, I uh, I've, the, I have um, I have not been happy, but I'm, I, I can say I'm not completely happy. 
but I am proud about the whole shutdown. I'm glad mm. he finally did that. Mm. Um, yes. Before then, I was very upset. I mean, ex- furious with him when we had, at first, it looks like he was backing down. This was back in December. It looked like mm-hmm. he was backing down from, you know, uh, from getting funding from the wall and was going to settle for the $1.3 million from, uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, for the wall funding. Then he, then of course, he, you know, he was going to sign the uh, bump stock ban, of course, and then the, the prison reform uh, bill passed, uh, or the, step, the First Step uh, Act. That in itself was just like, oh my God, these people are crazy. You know, uh, I know about that. The first, the first step act is just mind blowing. I'm not going to go into details about that, but that felt like a Democrat p- president in my case. Yeah. It, yeah. Just, it was like not, there's nothing Republican right winger about this. And then finally, mm-hmm. you know, with him now standing his ground on on the uh, on the on the government shutdown. I was like, okay. And then the mm-hmm. recently he offered DACA three year amnesty for yes. in exchange for the war funding. Right. And then the Democrats said no. So I was like, that was a good political move because now you're showing that the Democrats have absolutely no in- interest in negotiating. They're not coming with anything. Donald Trump is coming with, okay, how about this for the wall funding? How about this for the one for what five point seven million dollars a billion dollars is nothing really compared to what we spent. We sent ten million uh, Ten billion to Mexico, five billion to Central America, and we can't do for our own country. So it was just like it was a- amazing. But with that being said, so what do you give us grade now? <laughs> what do you give? Well, us see, grade? see, see, it fluctuates. Uh, uh, first semester, first semester, I gave him B minus. Uh, then uh, at the end of the first semester, he was sinking towards a C, maybe even a C minus. <laughs> but then now, now, he's, now he's back in B territory. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I, now, I will tell you something. Uh, we don't usually discuss uh, internal American Renaissance editorial policy uh-huh. uh, because, uh, you know, that's, you know, we make our own decisions. Right. But we have an annual feature called uh, Renegade of the Year. And that is the white person who has, uh, who has had potential to do good and who hasn't. And we were very seriously going to make Donald Trump renegade of the year. Really? Now, yes, we, we were that disappointed. But then when he shut down the government in the name of the wall, we said, oops, 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 nope, um, hasty judgment. Uh, and uh, and I'm hoping that uh, for the next two years, he will certainly not fall back into C, C minus or any worse territory. <laughs> and so that we will not make him renegade of the year. I'm keeping our fingers crossed. But no, uh, but, but, you know, the whole thing about DACA, for example, this executive amnesty that, uh, you know, the thing about it is it, it seems so transparent to me. Barack Obama was trying to get the Congress to pass some kind of blanket amnesty for these uh, people who were brought in as illegals when they were children. Mm-hmm. He couldn't get Congress to do it. And when he was beaten on Congress, he was saying, you know, this is a matter for Congress. And then when Congress couldn't do it, he just, well, I've changed my mind. There's something I can do on my own hook. That was just such a transparent double standard. Yes. Uh, nobody's much seemed to mind because it's the great Barack Obama, you know, my oh, Nobel, yeah. Peace, Nobel Peace, Pi- Peace Prize laureate just for being black. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, exactly. Because yeah. I'm like, what the hell did he do? I'm like, <laughs> and no one can tell me. Like, what did no. he do to get the Peace Prize? And no one can tell me anything. And then mm. did you hear this nonsense that, they, that uh, they're saying that the people who voted that for him to get it were saying that they were hoping that this prize will get him to stop a lot of wars to pull out of afghanistan just in order to do the peaceful thing did you ever hear that rumor i did hear that they were giving him the peace prize for what they hoped he might do isn't that crazy (laughs) and and you know you know uh if if donald trump actually succeeds in getting north korea to disarm that would be something that is probably worthy yes. of a Nobel Peace Prize. Yep. Can you imagine those Scandinavians actually inviting the orange, blonde-haired guy up to Stockholm to actually give a recep- you know, a thank you speech? Oh, they couldn't do it. You know, he could, he could, he could. Mm, well, let's imagine the most extraordinary achievement in the world in the in the realm of world peace. Let's imagine he he achieves that. Nobel Prize for him? Impossible. Yeah. They hate him. They hate him. They hate him. Doesn't make any difference. Doesn't make any difference what he does. But uh, in any case, uh, here, 
uh, Barack Obama, then, you know, instead of a first day in office, just issuing the order, like he said he would, he piddles around and doesn't say anything about that. And then he says, uh, you know, uh, I, I agree with my predecessor's original position. This is something for Congress. And so Congress, you all should pass an amnesty. Well, wait a minute. I thought you were opposed to the amnesty for heaven's sake. Why is he even... Why is he even considering this, whether it's congressional or by executive order? He was opposed to it, and now he's changing his mind. No, he's just an erratic guy. And uh, I, I really wish that he were a solid, thoughtful, honorable man of great integrity and conviction. But I'm afraid I've used a bunch of adjectives that simply do not apply <laughs> to Donald Trump. It's it's a tragedy. Here's a guy. Here's a guy who really, for the first time, is sitting in the Oval Office with some ideas that I think are vitally, vitally important. Mm -hmm. But then he is such a a, a defective man in so many respects. It uh, I, I would love to think of some man as uh, as I described articulating the positions that I think are absolutely essential for the survival of the United States as a coherent country and for uh, the, the United States as an outpost of Western civilization rather than as some sort of third world mishmash. But nope, nope, we've got this guy who uh, there are ample reasons to dislike him, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like who 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 can we have in, in replace of him? Like. Like, uh, we, we know that we're going to vote for him in 2020. Um, I'm really looking forward to 2024 because mm -hmm. I believe that the right has been infiltrated by Trump supporters who are really liberals. And I'm seeing a lot of nonsense, you know, coming on this side. So I'm, I'm hoping that 2024 will give us a chance to, uh, get our side back and, and I don't know. Maybe I'll just stay independent. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Well, I'm not convinced that Donald Trump's necessarily going to win in uh, really? in 2020. I'm not convinced. No. I mean, remember, he didn't get, he did not get uh, the majority of the popular vote. It was just by this almost uh, perfect alignment of uh, a few thousand here, a few 10,000 over there in this state and that state that he really won the electoral vote. So uh, I do not consider him a shoe in by any stretch of the imagination. Of course, it depends on who they put up against. I was going to say who who yeah. on the who on the Democratic side could beat him though. Well, Kam Kamala Harris just announced her. Beto O'Rourke is announced. We ha don't know <laughs> if Joe Biden. Joe Biden didn't say he was going to do it. We know right, uh, Hillary right. is. Can, she can forget it. <laughs> I know. hope she. I hope she does not disgrace herself by <laughs> failing to forget it. Yeah. If she hit that vodka a lot, she probably will. You know what I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> so well, you who, know, who I don't can, know. Who can, who can beat him? Well, uh, Beto O'Rourke might beat him. I think uh, uh, Joe Biden might beat him. But I think the Democrats are absolutely bound and determined not to put up a white man. Right. And so we're going to end up with somebody like Kamala Harris. Oh, by the way, her name is Kama. I think it's... Come yeah, on. I heard her say her yeah, name, yeah. and I said, "Oh my God, I've been saying this woman's name uh, wrong for so long." But mm -hmm. I don't care. I, I I I don't have respect for her, so I'm not even going to try to say her name correctly. <laughs> yeah, you should call her Kamala, wrong. Kamala, Kamala Harris. No, it's Kamala, Kamala. It's apparently it's an Indian name, and uh, Kamala means lotus. And the ah! lotus flower, yes, no, get there. come on, come on. The lotus flower sits upon the water, and uh, it uh, floats there gracefully above it all. And what? <laughs> and when water drops of water fall upon it, they are. It has a sort of natural kind of waxiness, and the, and the drops of water just fall away, and it stands there in its purity and its beauty, floating above the water. That's her name. Oh, mm -hmm. God. So, oh my God! Uh, I'm so glad so I didn't yes. have breakfast because to see this chick is a uh, lotus flower is laughable. <laughs> okay. Well, we we had a we had a Barack. We might get a Kamala. Mm -hmm. You know what? Mm -hmm. That is so true because, like but, I said, the people mm -hmm. who are the masters at ID politics are the Democrats, and you're they right. Are. They were already putting out articles saying. No, Beto O'Rourke is too white. We don't mm -hmm. need any more white men in the office. It's time for a woman of color. And here you get the you get the break too 
uh, mm-hmm. two barriers here for that's the right. Prussian Olympics, a woman and someone of color. Yep, that's right. Now, I don't know what the suburban soccer moms would think about uh, Kamala Harris. It's, it's, it's very hard to say. And, you know, I have not seen how she behaves in debate, how she behaves under pressure. I've not seen many interviews that she's given. And all of that, of course, all of the salesmanship is a huge part of running for office. So whether she's a good campaigner, whether she not she gives a good speech, I just don't have much of a sense of that. But she certainly fits the image that all of these progressives who see the future of the United States very, very clearly, that she <sighs> is the perfect example of that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she. If you see her with her with her interactions with um, the the leaders of Border Patrol, Border uh, the yeah Border Patrol mm-hmm. and ICE, she's laughable. She's very mm-hmm. aggressive, uh, mm-hmm. insulting, and I mean, I, she's 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 actually she actually the stereotypical angry black woman even though she's not completely black just like Barack right. but they still put her in the black category so but right. I noticed in her new recent campaign she's all smiling and happy and she makes her voice like this instead of like this so it's <laughs> like you know I was like oh she's trying to clean up her image to seem like she's likable laughable and this nice friendly uh, person I'm like ha! whatever well, you know, it'd be interesting to see who her running mate might be. You know, uh-huh. if 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 the if the really wild-eyed mooncalf lefties completely control the party, she'd end up with uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Can you imagine that duo? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> now, that would be ooh, the dynamic duet. Uh, but uh, then she knows she might she might uh, team up with the Beto O'Rourke or uh, Joe Biden. I mean, she's really at all serious about broadening her appeal. I just don't know. I just don't know. There is there are, you know, uh, I don't know to what extent media endorsements make any difference these days. But back uh, in 2016, there were some 600 papers that endorsed Hillary Clinton, and there were maybe a dozen that endorsed. Uh, that endorsed Donald Trump. Yeah. And there were a couple that said anybody, uh, there may be another score that said anybody but Trump. And so it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable that in the face of this obvious ferocious hostility, there were 60 million Americans who still voted for Donald Trump. Uh, I think that's a, that's a very encouraging thing. And the media begin to wonder, you know, what, what's happened to their credibility? Well, I'm delighted to see big media's credibility in shreds. Look at what they did with the Covington Catholic School uh, boys. Oh. Uh, that, that shows you what happened to their credibility. Yes, yes. That among and, other stuff they've done. Yes. This is happening more and more frequently, and they just don't seem to understand why their circulation goes down and why people are going to the Internet. Now, of course, the result is that those of us who convey a different and I think entirely more persuasive and authentic message are so often being deplatformed. Yep. Uh, now, have you had any trouble with yes, your platform? Yes, I had. I was deplatformed. I was taken off of Twitter for for ageism because I called David Duke a racist grandpa. So what? Yes, what? what? Yes. You're joking? I thought. I no, thought no, no, no. Called... They sent me. They actually sent me the tweet. They huh. also s- sent me their terms of services. And I know they can say I was racist. So it was like ageism. The, yeah, ageism. And I was like, yeah, okay. So this just goes to prove, prove to me that they need David Duke on that huh. platform so they can have a boogie monster. Because why would you get rid of a black woman who's talking crap about David Duke? <laughs> wow. A race, you call him a racist grandfather. I call and him they... a racist grandpa. A grandpa. <laughs> You know, that's interesting. When I was kicked off of Twitter, they never, ever sent me any tweet that said, here's why. Really? No. In fact, Well, because you they're... didn't say anything. There. They were... well, well, the reason they gave me is because I'm allegedly affiliated with a violent extremist group. Oh. Did you know that? No, I did not. I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea either. <laughs> uh, and they certainly didn't do the courtesy of explaining just what that group might be. Exactly. 
And the American Renaissance account got booted on that very same day. Yeah. They had this new policy. I think it was December 18th of uh, more than a year ago. Yeah. That's yeah. that's when they said, we're going to have this new policy. And you can just put photographs of kitty cats and beautiful, cute, young ducklings on your Twitter feed. But if outside of Twitter you do bad, bad, bad things, then we have the right to kick you off. Right. And, and apparently the bad thing that I was guilty of was affiliation with a violent extremist group. Now, as I say, not not even the SPLC would say that I'm affiliated with a violent extremist mm. group. So where they got this cuckoo idea, I don't know. But uh, that's their story and they're sticking with it. They have to say these things to justify deplatforming you. You see what I'm saying? It's just, to me, it's just, it's full of lies. They mm. can't prove it, whatever. I mean, of course they could prove I did ageism. But the fact is, is that I'm like, dude, are you serious? You defending David Duke against a black woman? Really? And for calling him a racist grandpa? Yeah. Gosh, that's that's mild by contemporary <laughs> I know. Stand. I let me tell you something. I I, I mm. never I never like you told your secret, I'm gonna tell my secret. All right. I have said a lot of crazy things on Twitter. Mm. And mm. when they and I mean a lot of a lot of stuff that would have got they would have justified in getting me banned. But mm. when they started to permaban, because people think I'm suspended and I'm coming back. No, I'm permanently banned. I refuse to come back. But the thing about it is, is that when they started to, to have these new terms of services and getting rid of people, I went through my entire Twitter f uh, feed and I deleted all of those quote unquote offensive tweets oh, that, were, that were acceptable at the time. Believe it or uh, not. Uh, okay. Uh, you can hmm. say the things I said back in the day, but now you are they're gonna use it against you. So I deleted right. them. So I'm thinking what they hmm. did was they couldn't find anything to get me with because they hmm. wanted to deplatform me. I was growing big time on Twitter and that this was the only thing that they could get me for. Well, you know, uh David Duke is a grandfather. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how that is ageism, <laughs> but anyway. But anyway. You're, 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 I'm sorry, you, you are still on Twitter tweeting away? Or? No, no, I, I refuse uh -oh. to come back. People are I begging see, me I to see. come back because okay. they I say see. once well, you get kicked you. off, yeah, once you get kicked off, they say you can just come back, and I'm like, I refuse, I refuse. Well, good. You're going to slip in, yeah, on principle, because I'm like, sure. you're going to get rid of me you, because of David Duke? That's just a <laughs> slap in the face. I'm like, no way, <laughs> no <laughs> way. Okay, I got one last question for you, and we're going to conclude our our, uh -huh. our discussion. One uh -huh. last question. I really appreciate your patience. Thank you so much for uh, mm. having this uh, discussion with me. It, it's been a hoot. Okay, the, ter the, the debate you had with Tariq Nasheed, okay? Mm. Mm -hmm. When did you get to the point where you realized that this wasn't going anywhere? <laughs> you know, I guess it was about... It took me, I confess, as long as 15 or 20 minutes. Really? <laughs> it took me a while. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I kept thinking that there would be some glimmers of logic. I thought he might be uh, someone who, like you, actually eats the fruit of the tree of logic. But uh, <laughs> that didn't seem to have happened. But, you know, I, uh, I don't know. I thought maybe later, afterwards, I thought maybe this guy doesn't even believe a word he's saying, that he's just giving me the rope-a-dope. That he was trolling you? Yes, no. <laughs> yes. I think that's possible. Uh, I, I just don't know. At, at the time, that didn't cross my mind, but some of the things he was saying were just uh, Crazy. So, it was yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it was uh, so entertaining. I have to give you that. Just your response and his response, excuse me, his response and your reaction was just comic gold. Well, I, I am like, so, I was so amazed and very entertained with the entire debate. Well, a lot of people appear to have been. Um, uh, it's not my purpose to entertain, but uh, uh, if, if that is a byproduct, then I suppose I should be proud of that. Apparently, it's very entertaining the way I pronounce the word white. Yes, uh, white. <laughs> I, I, I never even thought about that. That's the way my, my, my mommy and my daddy talk and my great my grandparents talk that way. And doesn't everybody say white? Apparently not. <laughs> But uh, if that causes entertainment and amusement, well, then, you know, it's two for the price of one. <laughs> Great. Well, um, as always, we had always a good time talking with you. 
And uh, I'm sorry, but this is not going to be the last. Uh, expect to hear from me again, as always. Oh, dear. Well, they say, they say third time's a charm. Maybe third time I'll actually say something worth listening to. So, so humble as always. Okay. Oh no, it, it, it's a real pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. No and uh, problem. best uh, you know, best wishes in all your endeavors. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have uh, all of the contact information also to uh, Mr. Jared Taylor's website, his YouTube channel, and all of the other things I can get connected to uh, him and his social media presence in the description box below. So you all be sure to check him out. And with that, I say later, taters. Thanks for watching. This show is independent and 100% viewer supported by awesome people like you through our membership program. To sign up, simply go to treeoflogic.com or click on the link provided below in the description box for more information.